Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome to this event as part of Interfaith Week uh, 2020. Uh, my name's Aftar Mathru. I'm uh, both a member of staff at the University of York, but also chair of York Interfaith Group. And I'm delighted to host this event because I think it's probably um, the first event of its kind at University of York, certainly for, for many, many years, uh, and certainly in this format, this sort of virtual format. Uh, the event itself um, is, again, uh, University of York and York Interfaith Group connected, a joint event. And I'm delighted to say uh, we've got support from uh, USU, so that's the um, Students' Union at University of York. We've got support from, from GSA. We've got support from Chemistry um, Equality and Diversity Committee and also the Equality and Diversity Office at the University, as well as the Vice Chancellor's Office. So the significance of this event today uh, can't be underestimated. Uh, the background to the event, um, we actually conceived this event way back in February, March uh, of this year. And then we all know what happened in March. And the idea was to have, a, have an event uh, over summer of last academic year. And that fell flat. And then um, the idea was to have an event literally in the first week of start of term. And that fell flat. So it's really, really brilliant that we're actually managing to have an event tonight, which then coincides with Interfaith Week. So in the background, uh, my colleagues from York Interfaith Group have been very supportive, as well as the chaplaincy at York. And uh, great to see um, Kevin, John and Catherine online as well have been fantastic supporters. In terms of the format tonight, um, we're going to start off with a poll. Okay? And the reason for that poll is just to gauge uh, what the audience is like, who's out there and which faith uh, are they most associated with. And then I'll start to introduce the speakers. So Lean is in control. Everybody's on mute. Uh, and the poll, I should say, is anonymous. So don't worry. Uh, we're not going to know which button you're pressing. That's, that's just to remind you. Uh, the event is is also being, being recorded. So we'll give you about 30 seconds. Everybody can participate. That includes the panelists as well. And we'll close the poll in uh, 10 seconds, uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you, we'll end polling. Okay, and obviously, um, I'm not sure if everyone can see that. Can we share the results, please, Lenny? Okay, so we're now, hopefully, uh, you can all see uh, the polling results. So uh, strong representation uh, from the Christian faith and its various denominations. Um, the only source of absent faith on that list is, is the Buddhist faith. Uh, obviously, we've, we've got some that are uh, of, of no faith and some that are assigning as other. It would be good at some stage um, if those two are who have assigned themselves as other faith and if they don't mind just telling us uh, which faith or other means that that would really help us. Uh, and in terms of tonight's event, uh, I'm delighted to, Lynn, if we can just close the poll. Thank you. And in terms of tonight's event, um, we've got representation from uh, the Baha'i faith. Uh, we've got Danny from Baha'i faith, Christian faith, um, or Christian union is represented by by Fergus and Christian Focus, uh, by uh, Rebecca or Becca Bailey. Uh, the Hindu faith by Abnish, uh, Islamic faith by Hannah, uh, the Jewish faith by Adam, and the Sikh faith by uh, Jasraj and Suraj. Uh, we've got a running order, and that running order is just in alphabetical order of the faiths that I've mentioned and the names that I've mentioned. And it's just customary when uh, we have a York interfaith group meeting, we just take some time just to reflect 
know, um, reflect on what may have happened a couple of minutes ago or in the day or last 24 hours, last month, this year, uh, anywhere, local to you or over the world. So if you'd like to join me just in one minute's worth of reflection, if everyone can stay on mute, that would be really helpful. Thank you, everybody. So just a reminder for, for tonight's event in terms of just the title is sort of my, my faith um, and my faith within the University of York, but also uh, my faith um, within the city. And uh, each speaker has got approximately five minutes uh, to tell us something about their faith, their feelings, their views, Rep they're representing their society as well. What, what's, the, what's the noise within their society? What's happening at the moment? Um, you can take it in any direction that you want. We have said to the speakers um, that this is not an advert for their society. So this is not a hard sell. Uh, so, so please uh, try to uh, refrain from that. Uh, this is just respectful dialogue and mutual understanding. Okay? And hopefully that's what we're trying to develop within the campus, but across the community as part of community cohesion. So on that note, I'd just like to invite Danny, you're our first speaker. And you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just uh, speak a bit about the Baha'i faith, what it is first, and then I'll go on to talking about what Baha'is in York do. That's what I have. So I can start with the Baha'i view of God. Um, to Baha'is, God is seen as an unknowable essence. This means that no matter how intelligent or wise we are, we cannot understand the nature of God. Like the, a, a table, for example, cannot understand the nature of the carpenter who made it. And in the same way, we humans who are created by God cannot understand our creator. But even though we cannot understand the essence of God, we can know him through his manifestations, otherwise known as prophets or messengers. Whenever mankind moves away from God, forgets his teachings and is in need of his help, God provides us with one of his manifestations who makes his will and purpose known to us. And some of the manifestations of the, of the past include Krishna, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, for example. And the manifestation for our time, Baha'is believe, is Baha'u'llah. So I can read one of... Baha'u'llah's quotes, um, which maybe can help us understand the belief. He says that the all-knowing physician hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease and prescribeth in his unerring wisdom the remedy. Every age hath its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. So the aim of the Baha'i faith really is to unify mankind. In the teachings we're told that we're all the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. And Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah and leader of the Baha'i faith after Baha'u'llah's passing says that Baha'u'llah has drawn the circle of unity. He has made a design for the uniting of all the peoples and for the gathering of them all under the shelter of the tent of universal unity. So the manifestation or messenger of Baha'u'llah was born in 1817 in Tehran, Persia, now known as Iran. 
uh, he didn't need to attend school as uh, Baha'is believe he was endowed with innate knowledge. He came from a noble family and when he was a young man was offered a high position in the court of the king, but he refused it. He wished to instead dedicate his time to helping the oppressed, the sick and the poor, and to champion the cause of justice. He would also go on to write thousands of works of scripture, notable ones including The Hidden Words, The Seven Valleys, The Book of Certitude or the kitab i Khan, and The Book of Laws, the kitab i Akdas. His works were originally written in both Arabic and Persian as well. Abdul Baha, again, the, the son of Baha'u'llah, summed up what being a Baha'i essentially means by saying, to be a Baha'i simply means to love all the world, to love humanity and try to serve it, to work for universal peace and universal brotherhood. So Baha'is and their friends up and down the UK and everywhere in the world have been trying to do this uh, in some small way. There are children's classes where the children learn about spirituality and virtues. There are junior youth spiritual empowerment programs for 11 to 15 year olds, as this is a period of special potency, a, a transitional stage in their lives, which can shape who they become. So these groups seek to enhance their powers of expression, their spiritual and intellectual excellence, service to the community and their healthy recreation. There are animators, people like me who aren't teachers, but older people who can accompany them by leading the sessions and the activities. There's also a series of course material that junior youth go through, which helps them to practice consultation and helps them to, challenge, uh, to channel their developing powers into service in their local community. I mentioned consultation. Consultation is a, an important concept for Baha'is um, who wish to engage in discourse with people of differing opinions and create a shared understanding and a common vision, like this event tonight. Which is great um, and there are also open open events for all ages in the community too uh, called devotional gatherings we have them every week in different homes in york or now over zoom and those even who are still learning about the faith and um, who aren't baha'is run them as well actually a few students on the uni who i who i know and who i invited um, so they're basically gatherings in which friends, Baha'is and others alike, unite together in prayer. Uh, they serve to awaken the spiritual susceptibilities within the participants and in concert with the acts of service they perform lead to a pattern of community life that is infused with the spirit of devotion and focused on the attainment of spiritual and material prosperity. So I can end now just by listing a few of the main principles of the Baha'i faith which is the oneness of mankind, independent investigation of truth, the common foundation of all religions, the essential harmony of science and religion, the equality of men and women, the elimination of prejudice of all kinds, universal compulsory education, a spiritual solution to economic problems and a universal auxiliary language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, really sort of fantastic start in what you had to say, very, very clear. Um, we've already got something in the chat that says brilliant presentation from, from Callum, who I know Callum is from um, uh, Church, of, uh, Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, so great start. And I think what you've said will probably now resonate with many of the other faiths and societies that all speak uh, this sort of common understanding, common principles. So just to remind uh, the audience as well, if they're wondering um, why we've only selected certain faiths, um, we haven't just selected certain faiths. We did reach out to all the societies uh, that were listed on, on, on USU. Um, we're aware that there are sort of many smaller societies and these are the societies that have responded. Um, so we're gonna go to uh, probably one of the largest societies and certainly the, the largest membership uh, for tonight's uh, audience, and go to, to Fergus, who's representing Christian Union. Fergus, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Fergus. Uh, I'm part of the Christian Union here at the University of York. Um, I'm just going to spend uh, the next five minutes sort of talking about what we believe in and what we're doing here. 
Um, so yeah, as a society, uh, we have one very simple goal, which is uh, that we seek to give every student on both campuses the chance to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel simply means good news, and I think that informs our mission here at the university. We believe that we've been given the best news in all of human history, and so I want to share that with as many people as possible. This is actually a very well-timed event for us as a society, uh, because we're currently in the middle of our events week. Um, as the name suggests, this is a week packed full of outreach events uh, designed to answer some of the big questions that students at both universities uh, might have, um, and then give them an opportunity to ask some of their own. The theme uh, of the whole week is life, what matters to you, uh, and every evening we're streaming a talk uh, and an interview with a guest on Facebook, uh, which then leads us into a Zoom call so that those watching can respond with questions. Tonight, for example, uh, the talk is on life with COVID, and we'll try and show uh, where we as Christians can find hope and encouragement in the middle of a pandemic. So if you think I haven't answered that question very well tonight, like, feel free uh, to, to find out a bit more um, at that. As a society, uh, we're a group of about 200 students um, from a bunch of different churches all across York. We aren't designed to be some sort of alternative student church, uh, but instead are a place where every Christian, no matter what their denomination uh, or differences they have, can come and find support on campus in sharing their faith with their friends and being equipped and encouraged to do that better. We celebrate the differences and disagreements between the different churches uh, represented by uniting around the core truths of Christianity about Jesus's life, death and resurrection. And from this unity, we're then able to encourage one another as we try and live as Christians at university and then form a solid basis for our outreach. Over the pandemic, we have continued to meet together virtually in order to encourage both new and returning students. Uh, to provide support and community for those that are feeling isolated by government regulations um, and to help freshers find a church family in York that can look out for them and help them to grow in their faith during their time at university. We've also continued to run as many outreach events uh, as we can because we believe that we as Christians know the one that can offer security and love that so many students across York need now more than ever. So for, for so many in the Christian Union, uh, the comfort and hope that is found in Jesus uh, has helped massively as we try and cope with the current circumstances. And we're doing our best uh, to share this comfort with those around us. I know that personally, my relationship with Jesus has been the anchor that has kept me steady over the last few months. As Christians, we believe that God, the creator of the universe, uh, became human and endured all the suffering and pain that comes along with that before laying down his life as a perfect sacrifice for our sins, making us right with God, um, and then was raised to life and will come again to bring about a new creation with none of the sin or suffering of the old. So when facing the current pandemic, this provides me uh, and the rest of the Christians in York with three incredibly comforting truths. Firstly, Jesus, as God, can sympathise with us in our suffering. He knew what it was like to be isolated, to feel anxiety, to be surrounded by illness, cut off from friends and loved ones, and even knew what it was like to die. So no matter what we've gone through over the last few months, and I know it's a lot, I know that Jesus can look down on me and relate on a deeply personal level to what I've been through. The second great truth uh, is that no matter how uncertain the next year looks, I know that my salvation is secure. Jesus' death and resurrection has already happened. I've already been saved, not through anything that I've done, but only with the grace offered to me through Jesus' sacrifice. I believe that my relationship with God as his son is never going to be affected by any lockdown or virus. And so I can face the pandemic with no idea of what the next few years of my life will look like, but knowing that in the grand scale of things, it doesn't matter because I know for a fact where I'm gonna end up. And that brings me uh, to the third, but by no means uh, the final comfort that can be found uh, in, in what Christians believe. That this pandemic, along with all other suffering in life is only temporary. We believe that when Jesus comes again, he will bring about a new creation, one that has been remade 
so that none of the brokenness that is so evident in life now will remain. To steal an expression, uh, it will be a world without hankies, without hospitals, and without hearses, because there'll simply be no need for them. So while for the last few months, this pandemic has seemed pretty unending, I can have faith that there will be an end, and not just an end to the coronavirus, but to all suffering. But one day, because of Jesus, all things will mend and be made new with his people restored and destined to join him forever. So that's where we stand as the Christian Union. That's what we believe and what we've been doing. Um, if you fancy uh, yeah, hearing more about that, uh, we've, we've got an event actually later tonight. Um, but or if you're just curious on sort of seeing or experiencing um, yeah, what, what we're doing in York and how our events sort of run, you're more than welcome to join us on Facebook Live uh, as we discuss it further. Thank you. Fergus, thank you. Uh, very, very powerful uh, messages there. Um, I, I certainly took on board that there's an anchor there, there's a foothold, and the relationship is stronger than ever, uh, which is really important. Uh, there is a place on campus um, uh, for everyone to go to. Again, just sticking with uh, Christian denomination, um, uh, Becca Bailey, uh, who's representing Christian Focus. Becca, over to you. Hi, so yeah, I'm obviously of the same uh, faith as Fergus, but um, so I'm obsessing Christian Focus and we uh, have more like, um, we have we like to discuss questions of faith and issues of faith and mostly provide a safe space for everyone to discuss those um, questions um, and like learn more from other people and to be as inclusive and diverse a group as we can be. So for example last week we had um, a talk from Anthony Reddy who's a Black liberation theologian about black liberation theology and its relationship to Black Lives Matter. So that's one of the things we really want to focus on is um, becoming more aware of the issues around various um, minority groups, I suppose, and um, just like putting our faith into action in being as good people as we can be and as supportive and respectful of everyone. Um, and yeah, that follows on tonight with having an interfaith event with um, some of the faith societies, um, a discussion of, about various issues, but it's not like a debate, it's just a place to learn from other people. And that's what we really like to do is learn and discuss and um, deepen our faith in that way. Um, and uh, so Christian Focus is affiliated with um, Student Christian Movement, which is a national um, movement of Christians. And they have um, also campaigns relating to things that are not just Christian faith. Um, so they've currently got one about peace and one about food. And that kind of relates to, so we had a workshop about how we could um, uh, act as peaceful um, as we can and have peaceful discussion and what that means and um, such and um, the food one especially kind of relates to York and um, wider this is an upcoming event so we haven't had it yet but um, about it will be about food poverty and we are really uh, we really care about such issues as like food poverty and such um, and we have so in the past we've had other workshops uh, we had one on climate change and have supported like the um, campaigns going on in the university to do with climate change and um, also supported the Amnesty International um, campaign about um, pro-choice abortion rights um, in uh, which is a York event that the campaign that's been going on um, so yeah we just uh, like to I, I personally just um, use my faith as like 
strength and um, just like hope that it can be better and with it we and as like inspiration of what we want to be which is as like Jesus as possible and just loving and inclusive and um, yeah just loving everyone um, so yeah and uh, lastly I'll just mention that we have I personally and as Christian focus we have relations with the chaplains at the university the Christian chaplains that is there are three of them and they have um, morning prayers and um, they used to have prayers and soup which isn't currently happening but um, in which we pray for the university the students the city and the world and I guess that is just embodies um, what we care about and um but we also want to put that into action i suppose uh i think that's all from me um but yeah thanks becca thank, thank you very much and um again this sort of theme of strength but also using faith to tackle global issues whether it's food poverty or climate change um, that's really, really sort of a very strong message and resonates through through the various faiths as well. Um, and I think we're getting these messages coming through on chat as well. Um, just the enthusiasm that so far all the speakers have shown uh, and positivity. And I was pleased to 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 hear you say that it's dialogue rather than the, rather than debate, and it's respectful dialogue this evening. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on to uh, Avnish representing the Hindu faith. Hello, Namaste. So I'm Avnish, and as Avatar Kali said, I'm representing uh, the Hindu uh, Hindu Dharma within this uh, discussion board, within this panel, sorry. So for Hindu Dharma, I would like to move away from the idea of faith, because I'm not sure how prevalent that is within our Dharma. But within our philosophy, we talk a lot about sanskars. These are shown through stories, through actions, through little tales taught from kids to in some of the most complex poems in the world, in the Mahabharata Ramayan, which are still trying to be understood by philosophers the world round. So these sanskars are here not to help us cope in times like these, but to help us thrive. So they're here to help us and show us how we can respond in times like these, times of crisis, maybe times where things aren't going your way because things are not going to go your way at all, uh, all times. So people are very complex and I feel like our dharma very well understands that. So it has very opposite views on a lot of things. So for example, for some people, they are safe and they feel comfortable with the idea that maybe they aren't in control. Maybe they can just go with the flow a bit. You can't control other people. You can't control the environment. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is enough to keep some people happy keep some people safe and uh, keep them hopeful and happy. But for some people, this of course is not, um, is not very good. They want maybe to the idea that they can control things. So our Dharma teaches that there is one thing in this world we can control and that is ourselves. So our Dharma teaches us through the idea of Ashtanga Yoga is one example of many ways in which we can control ourselves through simple actions that we can practice every day this comes from the idea of a bit of self-discipline a bit of meditation a bit of exercise and fitness all this done in the right steps with the right practice can lead to an idea of equanimity regardless of what situation you are in which i think is what we need to aim for in a time like this we don't want to be sad we don't want to be happy as there are people suffering we want to be equal equipoise and calm and focused. We want to see things how they are, because this is the easiest way for us to deal with things and see how they truly are. But yeah. So another thing that um, our Dharma teaches us is the idea of duty. As humans, as people with complex uh, with um, intellect, it is our duty to do good, to help others. This comes along with the idea that ability does not equal power, but ability equals responsibility. The more ability you have, the more responsibility you have. First for yourself, once you have 
uh, covered yourself then for your family for those close to you when you're able to do that then move wider first to those who you are connected with so for me maybe through the hindu society maybe within my course at, uh, doing chemistry at york and then once all these close circles are helped provided for and in a comfortable state then further wider into the city and up to the world but this again does not just talk about people with the idea within dharma you have vasudeva kutumbakam the entire world is one family so this talks again not just about people although people is a huge part of this this talks about nature this talks about animals plants our homes our cars everything because one thing that many um, Hindus like to see, like to think of, is all here, everything here is a manifestation of the ultimate, of, the, of our Brahman. So if we are all one and the same, we are made of the same, why should we not respect and not tolerate, not tolerate all, but respect all? If someone was to say to me, I tolerate Hindus, I would not quite like that. I want to be respected. So, yeah, I think I'm sure a lot of other, other religions mean it, but yeah. So the idea of respect and acceptance is absolutely huge. And at a time like this, with so for Hindus, a huge festival coming up, a huge Utsav coming up, sorry, on the 14th is Diwali. The story of Diwali is the idea, or one of the stories, I should say, is the idea of Ram Bhagavan one of the enlightened beings within Hindu Dharma, after a long exile, being able to return to his home and to his family, which of course we would all like to do. I know some people stuck in York, it can't be fun, it can't be good to be um, stuck away from your family, such a huge support group, or not just family, but any support group you may have. But we must adapt, that I think is clear. So one thing, um we are doing is idea of hosting zoom calls and just calls with family with people we know just to get everyone connected to get everyone to feel this idea of family you may or may not be related uh, through blood but through one way we are all related we're all here on this world together and as such we should be there to look out for each other to provide for each other and to help each other um and one fantastic story that comes up, which is related again to Ram Bhagavan within the Ramayan, is the idea of Seva, the idea that this links in the idea of uh, Seva, so selfless service, and the idea of ability is responsibility. So as part of um, trying to reach the kidnapped wife of Ram, Sita, they had to build a bridge across the sea. But across the sea, they couldn't build oh well they were building a bridge i should say but all the uh, big strong uh, army people the soldiers sorry army people the so soldiers were carrying boulders chucking them in the river uh, in the sea sorry building this huge bridge but then along came a little squirrel carrying little pebbles and dropping them into the holes some of the soldiers were like what's this squirrel doing he's coming in the way he's not helping much so ram Bhagwan, being the enlightened being he was said to this said to the soldiers right the squirrel will not put any more stones down let's see what happens and slowly with the holes through the stones water came through the bridge started to struggle and this i think perfectly depicts the idea that everyone as much of their ability although to some it may not seem like a lot every little bit of help every little bit of service is ideal is absolutely key for the sustenance sorry of this world of our of our being of our comfort within especially within times like this but always always and i think these are taught very well through hindu dharma yeah thank you thank you Avnish. um absolutely totally agree in terms of um if we all work together that's how we'll strive towards equality diversity and inclusivity that we're all at the set we're all on the same level um, irrespective of our backgrounds excellent thank you um, moving on now to the islamic faith 
and Hannah, over to you, please. So, salam, guys. I'm Hannah from um, the University's Islamic Society. So, we as a society like to provide a space for Muslims and to come together and practice our faith and be an ummah away from home. So, we know um, there's a lot of misconceptions about Islam currently in the media and in reports. So, we want to provide a space where people can learn about Islam and help defeat the many misconceptions out there. So we're trying to help spread the peaceful and the true message of Islam through how we act and how we present ourselves as a society. So um, we, later in the year, we have a Discover Islam Week. So it's a week where we um, help help people from all faiths come together and we, we kind of give stories about Islam, give, give, um, give just give an idea of what it's like to be a Muslim. So different, each day will be a different aspect of what it's like. So giving charity, praying, and just giving an all round like, view of what it's like to be a Muslim. And so I'm just gonna give a, uh, a few points about what it's like, cause it's, I know it's a thoroughly, thoroughly misrepresented faith. So we're, uh, um, we're a monotheistic faith that we follow one God. We believe that he sent down multiple messengers and these messengers came, came down with books. And the last messenger was uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he came with the Quran and we follow the teachings of the Quran, the way he lives and his sayings. And we also follow the five pillars of Islam. So that is praying, fasting, um, pilgrimage to Hajj, the belief in the oneness of God and charity. And one of the key things we like to focus on in the society at York is charity. So um, currently we've just finished Charity Week at York. So this is a week where we uh, we host numerous events for charity and normally it's in person but this year because of corona it's been online so it's been quite hard to raise money but in previous years we've raised about nine thousand pounds for charity and considering we're a small society that was a hell of a feat but this year we've managed around fourteen and a half thousand pounds in the last week so it was a massive feat and we all came together there's only about 30 of us in our society so the fact we were able to raise that amount was um it was hard but it, we also, um, many of the sisters know in this, um, especially in New York, it's hard to be a Muslim. It's hard to be a visible Muslim wearing a hijab out in, in public. So we try to provide provide a space where a lot of sisters especially can come together and come together and find a space where they can be themselves. It's hard to be the representation, the only representation some people meet. So some people have never met a hijabi, they've never met a Muslim in their life. And you do get a lot of stares in, in public in York. So it is, it is a culture shock for a lot of our members when they do come here and they do realize it's not as, it's not as diverse as some, some regions where they're from. So we try, and, we try and be an open society and we organize, um, we organize um, trips to the mosque to help people discover Islam. We organize um, talks with the Imam. We have local connections to help people who have questions. There are often a lot of emails to our society asking questions. We also we have links with the Imam to help people find out what it's like to be a Muslim and to help get rid of all the stereotypes and to help give a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one talk to a Muslim because a lot of people find their, media, find their knowledge from the papers, from, from the headlines, and we just want to be a space where someone, anyone of many faith can come and to see what it's like. So um, yeah, and... So currently we're still, we're still in the process of raising money. So that is, we're gonna finish on next week. So the link is in our bio guys, just a, a quick promo, but um, yeah. So that is the main, um, the main uh, aims of our society. And we plan to just be open and just to, we try and, and just, Welcome everyone, basically. Anna, um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, absolutely, um, it, it's 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 true. It's probably Islam is one of the most sort of miscontrived, misunderstood uh, faiths, and um, I empathise and sympathise the fact that it's hard to be a Muslim in York. Uh, you're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, I think this concept of all the faiths, there is an element of selfless service 
and uh, you're, you're turning that selfless service into sorts of thousands and thousands of pounds of donations. So we're really, really uh, 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 fantastic what you're doing. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on now to Adam Kaplan from the Jewish Society. My name is Adam. I'm the secretary for the Jewish Society or JSOC for this calendar year. We're quite a small society and there really aren't that many Jews around here or indeed in the rest of the country. So often when I'm meeting someone for the first time, I wonder if I'm the first Jewish person they've met. And I'm sure lots of other Jewish students have the, sort of, the same sort of thought process. I'm studying natural sciences, so I'm relatively fond of numbers. So to give you an idea of the Jewish population around, I'd, I've got some numbers to share. So there's only about 300,000 Jews in the UK. So that's about 0.4% of the population. Most of them live in North London, which is actually where I'm from. Close to York, the nearest Jewish community is Leeds, where there's a few thousand Jews, but there aren't that many in this city. And we estimate there's around 50 Jewish students currently at the university. And our, our members, they come from all over the country, some from abroad as well, representing all different denominations of Judaism. In the city, there's a small liberal Jewish community. And some of our members have been involved with them in the past, but generally the society tends to do its own thing. And I think interestingly, there are some universities where you'll have hundreds of Jewish students, so much more than here. So Leeds, Nottingham and Birmingham are sort of the big three in terms of that. So as a society, the main thing we would normally do is Friday night dinners. So every week, people could come communally and light candles to welcome in Shabbat or the Sabbath, you might have heard it called. And they also get a nice meal. There's quite a variation in people's observance of Jewish customs at home, but some people, myself included, have marked Shabbat in some way every Friday night of their lives. So keeping that up when far from home is a really nice thing to be able to do. Judaism is very much built around community, so bringing everyone together gives a good sense of belonging. And there's a concept in Judaism called a minyan, which is a group of 10 adult Jews. And that number is needed to say certain prayers and to read from the Torah. So community is something that's very important. And indeed, during lockdown, that's been quite disrupted. But some, some communities are continuing virtually. And we're, sort, we're very much thinking now about what we can do online as well. So initially, we were initially this, at the start of this year with, with lockdown, we were continuing with our Friday night dinners in groups of six, but unfortunately two weeks ago was the last one we'll be able to have until lockdown ends. One of the aspects of Jews in York and generally in our communities that I like the most is how many of the people that are involved had similar experiences growing up in Jewish communities. Some of us are what's known as madrachim, which is a Hebrew word meaning guides. And it's referring to young Jews, so usually around 16 to 21 year olds, leading various activities and programs for Jewish kids and teenagers. The JSOC gives us space to talk about these sorts of things that wouldn't really make any sense to other people. So I'll give you an example. If I say, if I talk about standing in a circle around a fire, singing the phrase, have a good week in several different languages, most of you quite understandably would be a bit confused, but that description strikes a bit of an emotional chord with many young Jews. So in case you are interested, that's something that we do at the end of Shabbat on things like summer camps and other events targeted at young people. In terms of what sort of events are on for Jewish students at the university, most of our events as a Jewish society aren't intended for the wider audience of university students or residents of the city. However, sometimes we are involved in such events. This one is an example. But to give another example, back in January, there was a Holocaust Memorial Day event at the Minster. We put forward a speaker to that, and there were lots of local figures and residents, both Jewish and otherwise, there. And we were also, earlier in the calendar year, we were invited to speak at an event put on by the Islamic Society about Abraham to give the Jewish perspective on him since he's a significant figure to both of our religions. 
So what I think can, what I hope you can see is that although we exist mainly for the benefit of the Jewish students in York, we see ourselves very much as part of the wider community of the university and the city. That's all I wanted to say, to say, but if you're interested in keeping up with what the society is doing and learning a bit more about what it's like to be Jewish around here, you can follow us on Instagram. Thanks very much. Adam, thank you very much. And absolutely, it's great that the Jewish society is looking to integrate with the wider community. Um, obviously, York itself hasn't had a, a good relationship with the Jew Jewish community, and there's that sort of long history um, behind that. But great to see that you're still keeping Shabbat on Friday nights and this sort of communal dinner. And that communal aspect is, again, a, a theme that's coming through. Thank you for that. In Next speaker, uh, I think next two speakers, this is a double act, and that's from the uh, Sikh Society, and that's Jasraj and Suraj. I'm not sure who's going to go first, but over to you. Um, Jasraj is going to go first. Yeah, I'm first. Um, I'm just going to take the first part of these five minutes to talk about the, the religion, Sikhi. Um, we founded in Punjab, which is if you meet a Sikh, most likely he's going to be from Punjab. You can trace his roots from there. Founded by Guru Nanak Devji um, in the 15th century. And he basically led a life of looking at the other practices of religion that existed in the East. And um, questioning some of the corruption that might exist in them. Um, so he set an example of a community that is focused on sincere devotion to um, God, and he showed um, equality in that in the, in that society where even he treated his own followers, his disciples, as brothers. Um, the message is for the whole world is it's a message of universal devotion beyond religious labels. Uh, what that means is we don't ask people to become Sikh. We sort of say. God is accessible through every religion and everyone has the capacity to um, meditate and devote on whatever name for God that you have or whatever understanding of God that you have. Um, and this is probably the most important thing he teaches, which is learning to recognize the light of God in everyone and um, having that compassion to everyone. And the saying goes, if you can't see God, in all, you can't see God at all. It's, um, you have to see God wherever you look, and, and um, that's part of your devotion. That's part of your devotion. It's got to be beyond religious labels or any divisive labels. So he always taught that we're humans first. Um, the first thing he said was when he 